Anytime you're ready. Well, why don't we do it now? Seeing as no one's getting paid by the hour around here. Mm. <clears throat> Especially you. Mm. <laughs> Nothing in our Constitution is more central to our ability to live as individuals than our right to speak freely. Not the right to speak without consequences, but the right to not be silenced simply because people in power don't like or agree with whatever it is they're hearing. Ironically, I learned that in college, a place that used to be a bastion of self-expression, but has since become a place where the actual right to speak freely has been trumped on countless occasions by another right, an imaginary right, the right to not be offended. The number of instances in which unpopular speakers and unpopular professors have been shouted down by students and protesters who simply don't want to hear anything they find objectionable or too numerous to chronicle. The intolerance is stunning, but so too is the resolve of the man you're about to meet. His name is Greg Lukianoff, and when it comes to defending your right to speak freely, you might say, he's on fire. Greg Lukianoff, I can't help but notice you're wearing the moniker of your uh, recently re-identified uh, organization. Well, we used to be the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, and we are now, completely different name, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. So much of everything that you did seemed to be limited to the college campuses, but this expansion is significant. We were founded in 1999 at FIRE, and almost since, you know, day one, people have been asking us to go off campus to, to take on the mantle of the nation's premier free speech defender. I think that, you know, the country really needs that nonpartisan defender of freedom of speech that they can always count on to be on the right side of, of, of free speech cases. And that's one of the things that I'm really trying to make sure that FIRE, you know, becomes. We call them like we see them, we explain the facts as clearly as we possibly can, and we defend free speech, even if I don't like what someone's opinion is. Free speech is an American value that black, white, liberal, conservative, um, with the exception of a pretty, you know, tidy elite up at the top, Americans love freedom of speech. They care about it. And I think they've all been kind of doing this for a couple of years, kind of like, you know, afraid to say they actually care about free speech because, you know, on places like Twitter and Facebook, or for that matter, in the workplace, they feel like they can have their career ruined at any moment. And what we're trying to do is break the spell and say, actually, Americans love freedom of speech. It's this really kind of weird, powerful elite that doesn't. What happened that made speech yeah. so breathtakingly tenuous on campuses? 2020 was the worst year for freedom of speech, I at least in the United States, that I have seen in my career. From 2001 to late 2013, the students had been the best constituency for freedom of speech on campus without question. They understood that you don't have a right not to be offended. They understood offensive lyrics. They got edgy comedy. And then suddenly that all ended in 2014 like lightning struck. Then you have 2017, where you start seeing the first explosions of violence on campus at a large scale in response to the election of Donald Trump. And so things were already like not so great. But 2020, it was just all coming to the head. And I think that COVID drove everyone a little nuts. I think the lockdown drove everyone a little nuts. But worst of all, I think when people become their Twitter avatar 24 hours a day, it prevents this kind of like what I call benign hypocrisy that essentially like you could be very political and very strident in a pre-social media and still go out for drinks with your Republican or Democrat friend that you disagree with. It seems like for the first time in the history of the world, billions of people are able to talk to each other in a weirdly unfettered way. I don't know that that's ever yeah. happened before. Never. I talk about like our relationship to social media as being like Henry VIII in 1521. He wrote his first ban on unlicensed printing presses in Britain. Because even though the printing press was invented in the 1450s, this was the first time you saw a real clampdown on them because they were responsible for religious wars, they were responsible for an uptick in, in the witch trials. From the perspective of 1521, it's like, why did we even build this thing in the first place? So I think we're in a moment where we can't see that adding billions of people to the conversation will at some point be shown to have real advantages. However, 
In the meantime, there's no way that we're not going through like a seriously kind of crazy period because it was a big deal when thousands of people could suddenly talk to millions of people thanks to the printing press. When you're adding billions of people to the conversation for the first time in human history, it's gonna be disruptive. There's no easy fix to the fact that we just experienced a massive phase switch, but hopefully we can learn how to be smarter about living with social media in our lives, about remembering some of the old ancient wisdom about not being so pompous, not being so moralistic, not being so um, uh, judgmental. So certain, oh, certain, yes. I think that certainty in a lot of cases is, is, is the enemy. I know we First Amendment people can sound obnoxious um, and self-certain ourselves, but the principle we're defending is that I know I'm wrong about any number of things. Um, I know I'm not all-knowing, and I suspect you aren't either. And this is a great small-D democratic idea. This is a great way to live, to be kind of okay with like, you know, I, 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 I don't know everything. There's a wonderful quote that sounds like a Zen cone when I say it to students on campus today, where it says, this true spirit of liberty is that which is not that sure that it is right. Huh. Good God, that's great. People will tell you that there's never been hate speech laws in the United States because of that darn First Amendment. That's not true. They have been trying to clamp down on hate speech on campuses since the 80s. And guess what it actually looks like? When you give power the ability to go after people for opinions they don't like, they go after opinions that people in power don't like. They go after students that they don't like. They go after professors they don't like. It ends up being incredibly unprincipled. It doesn't do anything to stop actual bigotry. And it ends up being used by people in power to punish people with wrong think. So, speaking of headlines, part of me wants to ask you about Stanford. What in the actual hell is going on? Judge Kyle Duncan, he's a Trump appointee, he's conservative, and he doesn't shy away from controversy. He's also a circuit court judge. He is one level below the Supreme Court. These are the kind of people that lawyers are highly deferential to because, you know, like we are trained that when you're talking to someone who's that eminent, that usually you kind of try to behave yourself. He had some conservative rulings relating to voting rights, you know, where uh, I, I don't agree with him on, on, on some of the stuff. But again, conservative judge, no, 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 no shock here. Who and was guy, invited, who was, was invited, invited to speak. So it begins with a shout down. Then an administrator, a DEI administrator gets up with a pre-prepared speech and the speech she gave, she asked, is the juice worth the squeeze over and over again? Which is just such an irritating kind it's of like- It's just borderline dirty too. I mean, I don't <laughs> want to inject that into this. So she asked this and she and what she's talking about is, is there anything that, that possibly that you could deliver that would be worth the pain that you're causing this community? It's kind of like, he's a circuit court judge. This is a, he, he came with a speech about how the Fifth Circuit deals with the Supreme Court. It was very much like, it's something that any constitutional law nerd should have been like dying to get, get into. And it's like, well, of course the juice is worth the squeeze. This is what you're here to study. Last time we spoke, I think we acknowledge that in many cases, things have to go splat. Things have to get a little worse before they get better. And when you embrace that idea, you look at a travesty like this thing at Stanford, this, this temper tantrum. But then there's good news, right? Because she's been somewhat repudiated by the big cheese. Overwhelmingly, the public gets that sh shouting down this judge was wrong and the students behaved abysmally. But after that, Dean Jenny Martinez, she came out and she apologized to the judge appropriately. And then the students revolted again, saying that counter speech is free speech. True, but counter speech is also not shouting someone down. She came out with this great statement on free speech that says, listen, we're not supposed to be the speakers ourselves. The university is not supposed to be taking political positions. The free speech actors, the academic freedom actors on campus are the professors themselves and the students themselves. Basically, nothing made me feel more despondent than the initial behavior at my alma mater. I felt like these are students who have been miseducated about free speech since they were little. They don't understand the idea that they, they don't get to shout down whoever they like. They don't understand the double standards that they were applying. Also, nothing's made me feel like more hopeful about the possibility that we are we, we could start to turn a corner than, than Dean Martinez's response, which was the best response I've seen out of an elite school possibly in my career. So talk a little bit, if you would, about fire and whether or not these kinds of things reinvigorate in you the sense of purpose that drove you to do this in the first place. 
You need a Twitter mob for free speech. Mm -hmm. You need a Facebook group saying, hey, actually, you know what? Don't fire the pizza guy who has an opinion you don't like. Don't, 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 don't get rid of someone from their regular job because they cracked a joke. People are tired of living like this. The danger is people can get used to the idea that, yeah, okay, I have political opinions, but I can't really share them or also lose my job. But Americans don't want to live like that. It seems like the, the key to better speech is more speech, not less. But also to make it useful, you should do some listening too. Free speech is essential, it's a human right, democracy can't work without it, and by the way, it's a lot more useful if you listen to people sometimes. Two ears, one mouth. And if fire does its job, well then, you know, everybody's gonna have a chance to open their big mouths and make a fool of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to know what people really think, is my main argument about freedom of speech. You're not actually safer for knowing less about the world. <laughs>